uh, Senator Royce West, thank you so much. Appreciate it as always. Um, well, just you know, here we are at the beginning of the new school year. All the school districts are going to start ramping up, welcoming students back to class. And I know all the school districts were told TEA by TA they've got to make sure all their exterior doors are working properly, et cetera. Um, have you had a chance to talk with school districts about these requirements, or and are you feeling confident that they will comply? Uh, to answer your question, I have. Uh, I've had uh, meetings with all of the school districts in my senatorial district to kind of get an idea in terms of where we are and what they think need to be done. And so from that vantage point, we discussed the uh, current uh, plight, if you will, of school districts around the state of Texas. Obviously, everybody was just um, incensed about what happened down in Uvalde, remembering Santa Fe and other incidents of you know, mass violence in this country. And so the, the, one of the biggest takeaways that I got from my superintendents and, and their uh, safety persons is that all of them did, in fact, have a you know, safety plan in place, assessment uh, staff on school on, and on campuses and things of that nature, but that they continue to stress a couple of things. Number one, counselors. You know, we've got to have more counselors on campus. I think the national average for counselors is like one to every 200, 250 students. But in the state of Texas, it's like one to every 350 to 400 students. So it shows you that there's a problem. And then uh, even though you have a counselor, counselors, are, uh, their primary responsibility, based on what I'm being told, is more towards testing and guidance counseling, which we think that's very uh, uh, important. But we also have a mental health problem on our campuses now. And so we need to make certain that those counselors, uh, uh, their workload is redirected and that they focus more so on issues concerning emotional behavior as opposed to just um, sitting watching students take tests. There should be other persons put in that position in order to do that. That's one thing. We've got to continue to look at the issues of hardening our schools. The vested views uh, in many instances need to continue to be as we go about building new schools that we've got to make sure those vested views are in fact taken care of. We've got to look at issues concerning how students, how people get into, get on campus and get into our school structures. Um, we've got to look at the relationship between local law enforcement or resource officers on campuses and that school district have resource officers on campus in order to make certain that if there is a problem that it's taken care of. And I think it's real important that as as uh, children go back to school, parents want to make certain that they feel safe. P students, the students feel safe, the children feel safe. Teachers want to make certain that they are safe also. We can't ask teachers to l learn how to carry guns in every school district in, in the state of Texas. Now understand, we've allowed that to be a local, is a local decision by school districts, which I support, but teachers should not be tasked with the responsibility of carrying guns in the classroom. They should be focused on making certain that we're, they're teaching our children but, and not have to worry about their safety. But, you know, I, I think that it's real important that we look at, just like we're doing uh, in, I guess you could say, in terms of academics, we have an accountability system. Uh, we do it in uh, fiscal affairs, an accountability system. We should look at a, a, a safe school accountability system in the state of Texas and get the best and brightest uh, Texas School Safety uh, Center along with uh, TEA and others to come up with a, an accountability system so uh, parents will know how their school and school district rates as it relates to safety and security of students. I know back in October of 2020 the Texas School Safety Center did a audit about the school districts uh, that you know submitted their plans for multi-hazard emergency operations you know plans and a separate part of that was um, active shooter policies and as it relates to active shooter policies I believe it was 200 of the they said thousand plus school districts had their plans were viable 
two hundred out of out of, of twelve over over a thousand yeah. twelve hundred school districts. And right. then at the same time, the uh, multi hazard emergency operation plans only sixty seven were deemed sufficient. Um, and I I'm trying to find out if there was an update since then. I've requested it, and I'm waiting to hear back. When you hear those kind of numbers, what goes through your mind? Again, parents and the public is not aware of that. Uh, the fact is, is that there's probably one story on that, and that's it. And parents need to be made aware of that in terms of uh, whether their school district and the campuses of the school districts are compliant. And then you can be assured that those parents will take it up with the school board to make certain that those school districts are in fact compliant. The other thing is this, uh, when you think about the parents in our school districts and the students, uh, we've got to make certain that they understand that this, in order to make certain we have uh, pro safety programs, it takes resources. And we, it just can't be a one grant from the federal government or from the state government. School districts are going to have to have ongoing sources of revenue in their general budget in order to update the plans that they currently have in existence. And, you know, I think, it, it, well, during the state senate uh, hearing, you were there. Yes. Uh, the committee hearing. And there was an exchange that I saw between the head of the Texas School Safety Center, um, Dr. Martinez Prather, and uh, Senator Campbell. And it was talking about on-site compliance checks uh, at the school districts. Do does the Texas School Safety Center go to these school districts and do checks, spot checks, whatever? And um, the head of the Texas School Safety Center said, "Well, it's unclear what authority we have to do that because the law doesn't stipulate that." And Senator Campbell said, "Well, does the law stipulate that you don't have that authority?" And she, uh, the head of the Texas School Safety Center said, well, we don't believe we have the authority because the school district could tell us to get lost. We, you know, you have no right to be here. Um, there is the local control that you mentioned, but is it time that the state be more assertive when it comes to safety and, and compliance? In certain areas, yes. Uh, we've got to make certain school districts are in fact compliant. Uh, after all, it's our responsibility to every student and every parent that has a son or daughter, niece or nephew in schools to make sure that they're safe. And that's not a Republican or a Democratic issue, it's a Texas issue. And regardless, we want to make certain that they're safe so school districts will have to adhere to standards that are put in place by state government. And as far as like the, the accountability, I asked Governor Abbott about this last week. He said, given what happened in Uvalde, there wasn't compliance because exterior door unlocked, classroom door unlocked, et cetera. And then when you go back and you look at, that's what happened in Santa, Santa Fe. Fe. And so you wonder, is anybody paying attention? I mean, what, what, when you hear that, what, what goes through your mind? What goes through my mind is, is that some school districts are not taking this as seriously as they, sh it, as it should, as they should. When you have instances like uh, what happened in Santa Fe and also Uvalde, those should be lessons that are learned and so we don't have a repeat of it. Um, based on some of the reports that have come out that obviously some of the exterior doors, it was a, a, an habitual uh, uh, way of uh, acting uh, in Uvalde where the doors were habitually uh, opened, unlocked, and so it, which should not have occurred. And then you end up also having communication problems down there. And so what does that say? A lack of resources necessary. And uh, assuming that it was, in fact, these doors were left open, uh, the leadership there was not putting in place the, in, uh, the policies and, to make, and making certain that there, were, uh, there was compliance with them. One other topic that we heard from, we, we talked to a student who survived Santa Fe. Sure. And he question whether the school districts are providing enough mental health services. And one thing that SB 11 created back in 2019 was the Mental Health Consortium. Right. And so this would offer a, the TCHAP program, which was telehealth, mm -hmm. for school districts to offer to students. 
And um, we interviewed, a colleague of mine interviewed Dr. Lakey, who heads the consortium. David also, Lakey, right. Because he mm -hmm. uh, testified to the committee. And he told us it was a two-fold problem. One, uh, school districts um, didn't feel the need to, you know, they weren't on board with, with joining the program. And they had a difficult time, and they're still having a difficult time, finding metal, you know, professionals who can provide these services because of the pay is low. And so in our research, uh, we found 365 school districts took part in the TCHAP program out of, so maybe a quarter, you know, of, mm -hmm. of the school districts, anywhere from a third to a quarter. So when you hear that, what, what do you think? We recognize that that's a program that should, in fact, be instituted throughout the entire state of Texas. We have over 1,200 school districts. You've got to look at it to figure out how do we, number one, get the resources to do it. And, that's, and the question in terms of resources, those resources are competing with other needs that we have in the educational system. So is that the number one priority? And many people would say yes. And so we've got to make certain we dedicate the resources that are necessary. We have $27 billion. And so the question is, how much would it cost to institute that particular program and get the necessary uh, staffing that would be appropriate. We know that there's a mental health problem. We put over $3 billion in the consortiums with uh, most of our uh, health science centers around this particular state in order to come up with partnerships to address critical mental health issues. Surely this is one. And so we need to make certain that those resources that we put in place there are used in order to facilitate the development of programs around the state and then as we go back in the legislative session we've got to look at some of those monies that we currently have uh, uh, set aside in reserve in order to uh, prop up those particular programs. That's I shouldn't right. say prop up but uh, build up those particular programs. And the 27 billion you were referring to is the nearly 27 billion in the surplus that will the state will have at the end what's, what's projected to be the end of basically next year at this time. That's exactly right. So um, we, we even actually, the station, if I may, the station came up with a, a map um, of the entire state. And they, we, what we did is we came up with, we looked at the TCHAP program, NTA data, and we came up with this map, and I'm, I'll try to make it bigger. All of the green counties in the state had adequate health, you know, mental health resources. Okay. The blue had, you know, the the telehealth program. Mm -hmm. The red had no access to to mental health care, mm -hmm. and the orange, which you see a lot in our area, had inadequate. Um, and so, when you look at that map, what do you think? It, what it tells me is that we've got a lot of building out to do. Uh, obviously, we've got 254 counties, and the reality is that these things take time to build out. And so, it, number one, it should be a priority issue, uh, and, and, and being a priority issue means that we've got to build out these systems in the state of Texas in order to make certain that young people have the mental health, not only young people, but that Texans have the mental health services that we need. It's becoming more and more of an issue in Texas. And so we've got to deal with it. And we know that there are issues in our schools. So building out the telemedicine programs, telehealth programs for rural Texas is important. And that goes uh, hand in hand with building out our broadband systems in Texas. And I want to make certain that people know that these things do in fact take time, but it's a priority for all of us to make certain that we get these systems built out. And you know, as far as this, I know that, as I was asking my colleague about TCHAP, mm -hmm. you know, is it mandatory, is it optional? It was optional. Should it be mandatory? You know, I think we've got to have a, I think it should be mandatory, but I think we need to continue to have a discussion about whether it should be mandatory or other, uh, optional. The fact is, I think it should be. Now, make sure you let the people know what TCHAT is. Right, and we, and we will, because okay. obviously that TCHAT is the telehealth program mm -hmm. that people they can get these services over 
broadband, you know, right, and right. telehealth mm -hmm. and all that. So yes, of course. And so my, my question to you then if, is... If, if, if we're going to build out the system, we've got to use all the tools at our disposal. And one tool may not fit all, but we've got to make certain that um, if, if we have T-Chat and we know it's a viable program, uh, we've had our experts come in and talk about the, the good, the bad, and ugly, but there's more good than bad. The bad being is that we don't have it, the adoption rate that we should have uh, by school districts throughout the state or, the, uh, uh, or as many particular programs throughout the state as, as we actually need. Does it surprise you? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, the fact is, is that, you know, we will, you can pass a piece of legislation. It's going to take five or six years to get full implementation of it. That's just the normal process of legislation. But I would think that given Santa Fe and some of the issues that we've had in terms of uh, telemedicine in rural areas, that we have more of a higher adoption rate than we currently have. And so knowing all this, Senator, um, what are you going to do to try to make sure that this will happen and it will happen faster. Well, I'm, I'm going to do two or three things. Number one, I, I will, assuming that I still serve on the committees that I'm currently serving on, I'll move to make certain that we continue to have funding. Listening to the superintendents in my senatorial district. Now, mind you, I have more of a rural suburban district and I don't have a rural district, so I've got to listen to my rural colleagues in terms of what the issues are in rural America. I think I know what they are, and I've been, um, I've been responsive to them, and I've got to continue to do that. You've got to continue to have the coming together of people that are responsible for making these decisions, and we need to make those decisions. So what decisions do we need to make? I want to make certain we have more money for counselors, number one, and that we begin to, uh, at, uh, working with school districts to kind of redefine what those roles are for counselors which means we need more resources to do that. We've got to make certain that we continue to look at hardening our schools, but we've got to make certain that they don't end up looking like prisons. And we've got to make certain that teachers aren't tasked with the responsibility of having uh, loaded weapons in the classroom, but they, they can still go to school, go to college, become a teacher without having to worry, overly worry about their safety in the classroom and not end up saying that they have to have a gun in the classroom. We've got to make certain that the parents feel comfortable with their kids going to school. That's why I'm, I'm advocating that we have an accountability system, that, that schools get accountability ratings, just like they do in academia and also financials. We've got to also look at the issue of mental health. Uh, we've got to task the uh, consortium that we've developed in the state of Texas, working with our local mental health uh, agencies with coming up with resolutions, or, or I should say, I shouldn't say resolutions, but coming up with uh, ideas to implement in order to arrest this particular mental health pro uh, problem that we have in the state of Texas. You look at uh, our jails being the repositories, frankly, of many individuals that have mental health problems. And so building out some of the mental health hospitals like we're doing here in Dallas is a step forward but it's not the only step that needs to be taken. One other question I had, and that was just on um, House Bill 19 that came from the 2019 session, and this was a little different from SB 11 and the consortium, but this... Well, you know, uh, let, let me say this too. Yeah. We need to, even though we have looked at the, the federal government, knock on wood, for the first time in a long time, passed some gun laws, some gun safety laws, which I think was great, but we still have got to kind of look at that. Should we be selling assault weapons to anybody under the age of 21, okay? And I know this is an NRA state, but the fact is is that we've got to consider that. When you begin to look at some of the polling in this country, in this state, most people say no to that. If you're under age 21, you shouldn't be able to buy an assault weapon. Now, will legislation like that pass in the state of Texas? It's, it's doubtful, but will, be, will there be those that will advocate for it, I'm one that will. And just on that theme, as far as the, you know, expanding uh, background checks. And I, I didn't mention that, but exactly right, yes. Do you think there are enough Republicans on board who will pass that? And will you be having, or have you had those? Kinds? I think there's a number of them on board, but will they work on that? I don't think so. 
So you don't see that as being likely? I don't see that being likely, even though I will try to convince as many of them as I can. You've got to convince the leadership first. Without the, without the governor, the lieutenant governor and speaker on board, it's not going to happen anyway. So the question is, do you, do you waste legislative, precious legislative hours trying to get something done if the leadership is not um, supportive of it? No, you don't. Okay? You may very well talk about it when you get the opportunity to do so on the floor. But, you know, obviously you, gotta, you only have so many hours and, and so many things that you'll be able to get done. So you've got to work on the things that you can. My last question, that was just on this uh, House Bill 19 from 2019 session, uh, the use of uh, local mental health authorities and um, employment of non-physician mental health professionals as mental health and substance use resources. A local mental health authority shall employ a non-physician mental health professional to serve as a mental health and substance use resource for school districts located in the region I, my guess free of charge, and that was not required, that was optional. Um, I don't know enough about that one, okay. that's okay. Yeah, I didn't know, yeah, it's on Bill 19. Huh? But, you know, again, you think it's a conversation that needs to happen about mandating, because, you know, the, the overall sense from people we spoke with who were directly impacted by it is that the, the laws didn't go far enough ensuring that school districts would follow. I think that, you know, when we start talking about mandating, um, over the 29, 30 years I've been in the legislature, I know there's always been a love-hate relationship between mandates and discretion, okay? Uh, this is what I've learned. What I've learned is, is that to the extent that we have provided discretion to local governmental entities, be they cities, counties, in this instance, school districts to deal with a problem that we think is a problem that impacts the entire state of Texas, but they have not done so in dealing with the problem in a manner that we think as a state they should, then we need to look at mandates. But if it's a situation where there's a gray area, we've got to give local school districts a, I guess you could say, a, a policy directive and then give them the flexibility to deal with the issue because you cannot have just one solution statewide given the 254 uh, counties that we have. But again, it was of such a magnitude as what we're dealing with now, we've got to have a serious discussion about what are the um, political initiatives that we have said, uh, or policies that we've implemented that need to be addressed locally that have not been addressed to the satisfaction of the legislature. And if we uh, determine what those are and there's a political will, then we need to mandate that they take place. Anything else you'd like to say? That's it. Bye. Yeah. Thank okay. you, Senator. Really appreciate it.